ophthalmic emergency and if not adequately managed can often result in significant morbidity affecting adults in the prime of their age and as you all know alkaline injuries are much more common the different substances are acid in the form of sulfuric acid that is very common in car batteries and fertilizers and there is nitric acid and chromic acid and also interesting to know is that hydrofluoric acid which is present in rust removers are actually weak acids but has a reactive anion the next in line are alkaline substances as you know there is ammonia which is present in fertilizers and cleaning agents and has a very rapid penetration there is also sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide there is also calcium hydroxide in the form of lime that is commonly seen in cement and one thing to note here is that lime has a very poor penetration the pathophysiology as you all know acid injuries they dissociate into hydrogen ions and anions and the hydrogen ions actually damages the ocular surface and alters the ph and it's actually the anions that causes protein denaturation precipitation and coagulation this actually forms a layer and further prevents prevents the further penetration of the acid chemical well the injury with acid though the penetration is quite less the morbidity cost or the involvement of limbus is much more common in acid injuries coming to alkaline injuries it dissociates into hydroxyl ions and cations and it's the hydroxyl ions that saponifies the cell membrane and alters the ph whereas the cations actually damages the stromal collagen and the glycosaminoglycans well the classification there is hughes classification roper hall's classification and duas classification hughes is quite old classification uh, stated in 1946 well it's actually 1965 that roper hall came up with a classification that was well taken and it mainly characterized two points that is limbal ischemia and the amount of corneal epithelial involvement the limbal ischemia according to roper hall's easy to remember is that grade 3 mentions clock hours from 3 to 6 or 1/3 to half limbal involvement and sim- at, at the same time the corneal epithelium is defined as how much of the iris detail is appreciable that is very hazy view of the iris details is occurring in grade 3 well <coughs> uh, actually dua uh, dua question this and he stated a new classification in 2001 but it was not until 2011 that paper started publishing comparing the efficacy of roper hall's and duas well it's it was because of the entry of the pre decimates membrane in the form of duas layer that this classification gained importance well what did he state he did in- include limbal ischemia as a characteristic point but he stated that it's actually the conjunctival involvement that is much more important than the cornea so he according to him grade 3 is involvement of limbal clock hours from 3 to 6 clock hours but he stated that this is having a good prognosis unlike roper hall's who stated involvement of 3 to 6 clock hours is actually having a guarded prognosis and he included an analog scale as well here that is in analog scale is actually a ratio between the amount of uh, limbal involvement and conjunctival epithelial involvement so that is the division for example if it is a grade 3 that can range from 3 clock hours divided by 30 percentage of the conjunctival involvement that would see 3 by 30 well as i said it was in 2011 or sorry 2013 that the publication came about the pre decimates layer but the paper other articles and journals did publish about the duas layer right from 2011 and studies comparing the efficacy of duas classification and roper hall's did state and did start from 2009 2010 and 2011 and it was stated that duas classification has much more clinical significance than the roper hall's classification well for example now this is a grade 1 and this has to be the limbus we compare and according to this this is grade 1 wherein there is no limbal involvement this is grade 3 wherein more than 3 to 6 clock hours is involved and there is a 30% of conjunctival involvement here 
so this is grade 3 this is grade 6 that means total conjunctival in epithelium is involved as well as 12 clock hours of limbus is also involved here well this is a description about dua why he came up with a new classification because the main difference here is about grade 3 according to dua's classification it has a good prognosis because of the recent uh, developments in the management strategies and also involvement of the conjunctival epithelium as a comparative factor here well coming to the management that is the topic topic proper we there is division of these phases based on the management strategies by McCulley into four phases he stated there is an immediate phase there is an acute phase that is from day 0 to day 7 then there is an early repair phase that starts from 7 to 21 and there is a late repair phase that is after 21 days in the immediate phase we have to do an eye wash or an irrigation in the acute phase we have to do a medical treatment early repair phase is continuation of that medical treatment it's actually in the late repair phase that we do surgical measures the only surgical measure we do in the acute and early repair phase is amniotic membrane transplantation and debridement of the surface this is a short video about uh, irrigation so this is a good tub that they sh have shown in the video then you examine the ph first then you instill a little of paracaine into the eye then you rub the fornix and clear the surface of any particles both the upper and the lower lid has to be wiped off then you irrigate with a cannula and instill paracaine if the patient has pain in between never forget the other eye so this is the order assess the ph apply anesthetics remove particulate matter and irrigation and at the end compare the ph this is a morgan contact lens that can also be used for washing and never forget to avoid the upper lid and clean it off particles well can we wash with water well it's a hypotonic solution so what happens is the cells are in a hypertonic state so they tend to absorb water and get swollen up so it's ideally not indicated the best solution would be a balanced salt solution but the problem is it's highly costly well i did refer a bit about the litmus paper so this is the scale of the ph we should know that 7 is normal that usually green and acidic ph is usually pink in color and the alkaline phs are towards the blue and what is litmus litmus is actually a water soluble mixture of different dyes that's extracted from lichens so i found uh, i googled for lichens so they turned out to be actually algae that is grown on, in the sea water well after the immediate management we come to the acute management that is usually medical treatment so how how do i start the specific therapy is actually usage of preservative free antibiotics every hour tear substitutes every two hours corticosteroids six times a day so that will be three hourly so this is in decreasing order you start with antibiotics hourly tear substitutes every two hours and steroids every three hours then we think of topical cycloplegics to release the ciliary spasm two times a day. Then we have anti-glaucoma medications if needed. There is systemic support with uh, vitamin C three times a day, one gram each. Then there is support from doxycycline 100 milligram orally twice a day for five days. So why are we giving all this? We may consider amniotic membrane if required. May be required from grade two to grade four. So why are we considering all this? Why steroids? Steroids, does it affect the rate of epithelial healing? Never. What does it affect? It affects actually the stromal repair. So it impairs the keratocytic migration. It affects collagen synthesis. It has a deleterious effect only in the early repair phase, not in the acute phase. So actually we have a window period here up to the 7th to the 10th day. If by the 10th day the epithelium has not healed, then we have to use steroids very cautiously. So which steroid to use? There are studies comparing this. So it does state that fluoromethylone acetate point 1 suspension given 6 times had has a good efficacy as giving prednisolone acetate 1 percentage 6 times. There is also studies comparing uh, fluoromethylone with lortiprednol and they have been found to be equally efficacious in terms of IOP and efficacy. Well, there are few studies that does claim that 
Lotiprid has a little more IOP elevation than fluoromethylone. Personally, I prefer fluoromethylone. The next thing is promotion of epithelialization is by tear substitutes. If for grade 1 to 2, it's actually helping in epithelial migration and grade 3 to grade 4, it prevents conjunctival scarring and symbolophoron formation. So which CMC or tear substitute to use is CMC 1%. I wouldn't prefer gel forms because it enhances the stagnation of toxic material and the inflammatory materials there. So always prevent it. There is no significance in giving erythritol, glycerin, uh, glycerol and uh, L-carnitine combinations like Optive eye drops here because again we want to wash the eye off the toxic materials rather than uh, increasing or decreasing the osmolarity. And the next in line is polyethylene glycol and uh, propylene glycol that forms a coat. Here also we needn't be using this. So now we have controlled the inflammation. We are trying to heal the epithelium and now we come to the stroma. So what do we have here to support the stroma? We have vitamin C that is in the form of ascorbate. We give chewable tablets, two tablets, three times a day, totaling around three grams dosage per day. How does it help? It's a cofactor in collagen formation. It damages, it prevents damage, the damage to the ciliary body epithelium has already decreased the ascorbate in the aqueous humor. So this helps to increase that. And it, this further helps in decreasing the formation of sterile corneal ulceration. The next drug in line is doxycycline. It is an anti-collagenase effect and it inhibits the collagenases by acting as a chelation of zinc, chelator of zinc. So the preferred tetracycline is doxycycline. We give it 100 milligram twice a day for two weeks. Well, there is a study that states that prolonged treatment with topical steroid when used with conjunction with vitamin C is not associated with a corneoscleral melt. So the adjunct treatment to this, we have uh, broad spectrum antibiotics in the form of Vigamox given every hour. Supported if an IOP elevation is there, we give astrazolamide half tablet three times a day and also cycloplegics. I prefer tropicamide if it's milder uh, injury and if, uh, if it's severe, we, uh, I give atropine. In between, uh, we may also uh, opt for homide. Surgical treatment, we have in acute phase and the early repair phase is amniotic membrane transplantation. The first, we have to debride the surface of all the toxic materials. This would help in decreasing the inflammation. We also have to get rid of the uh, chronic releasing uh, line and see if there are any retained particles in, uh, in the phonics. If the pH is not getting controlled or if not, not getting better in spite of very good irrigation, that tells us there are some retained matter in the ocular surface. Then we have amniotic membrane transplantation. So what are we discussing here? Amniotic membrane is actually forming a new basement membrane with a new stroma which has an anti-inflammatory action, anti-scarring action and an anti-angiogenic action. So there is amniotic fluid, there is amnion and there is chorion. So this is the division between the amnion and the chorion. The amnion, when we take, we have an epithelium at the surface, then there is a basement membrane, then there is the stroma uh, form, uh, formed from combat layer, fibroplastic layer and the intermediate layer. There are two ways you can place this on the ocular surface. One is known as the inlay. Inlay technique, we place it with epithelium up or stroma down so that the epithelium uh, of the surface grows over the amnion and this lay stays inside. So it's an inlay procedure. There is also an onlay procedure wherein we place the epithelium down or stroma up so that the epithelium grows under the amnion and this is on the epithelium that grows. So this is an onlay technique. The next is an early repair phase. It's actually a continuation of the medical treatment and it's tapering. So we continue or taper the steroids with observation because there are chances for a stromal, sterile stromal ulceration to occur here. So we have to be a cautious, we have a cautious use of steroids from 7 to the 21st day. So continue the vitamin C. Uh, then we continue the systemic doxycycline 100 milligrams. So there is chances for a persistent epithelial defect to occur here or a sterile ulcer as well. So we have to keep a guard about all this. Then a procedure we may have to do here is tenoplasty wherein we uh, make a conjunctival or a tenons advancement or to, in order to re-establish the limbal vascularity. 
usually may be required in grade 4 injuries. The next phase is the late repair phase wherein the method of treatment is surgical that is after the 21st day. So what do we have here? We taper the medical therapy and ensure the re-epithelialization is complete. May, if there is a perforation, we have, may have to think of tectonic procedures in the form of glue BCL or a patch graft. We may have to assess the limbus and may proceed with a limbal stem cell transplantation with or without amniotic membrane. So what is glue BCL? This is again a short video of a patient I did post fellowship. So here I will have to quickly run through this. Uh, as you can see, I have debrided the surface of all the epithelium and forming the anterior chamber with air. Then I have uh, placed glue on the surface. You can see this video completely in my in YouTube channel. So I will have to hurry through this and a glue BCL is placed. So this is Amcrylate, that is the company's name and it comes in this way and this is how you put the drop on the surface. Well, this is about patch graft. We have to do this when the perforation or the opening is more than 2 millimeters glue one stay. Then you will have to do a patch graft from a donor cornea. Late rehabilitation, what all do we have? We have to think of ocular surface stabilization. We have to think of limbal stem cell transplantation penetrating keratoplasty and keratoprosthesis. Starting with ocular surface stabilization, what are the options we have? We have to ensure that the lid, there is no entropion, ectropion or trichiasis. If so, we have to refer to oculoplastic surgeon. We have to address the persistent epithelial defect by debriding the margin of, of the epithelium and ensure there is a good tear volume and treat accordingly. Uh, we may have to cover it with a BCL as well. We may have to release the simbolophoron that is present and do an amniotic membrane transplantation. Once the surface is stabilized, we may have to address the ocular surface as such. If it is totally scarred, we can think of a mucous membrane graft for the palpebral part of the conjunctiva. This is taken from the inner part of the lower lip usually so that the mechanical stress or the rubbing of the uh, epithelial surface of the cornea can be prevented by doing an mucous membrane graft. Then in the late rehabilitation phase, we have the next step is limbal stem cell transplantation. Well, what is the limbus? What are the important things you have to think of here? This is the normal corneal limbus. We can see the palisades of woke here very beautifully. So if you have it enlarged, we can see that there are stem cells underlying and there is also transient amplifying cells. So this is the important thing that has to be transplanted. So we have to take a part of the uh, limbus that's a little into the cornea. So this will give us good amount of transient amplifying cells. And this is what we mean by a limbal ischemia. So we have a 12 clock hours of limbal ischemia. There is no vessels at all or we cannot see at any limbal palisades. Well, now this is the proposed classification of different types of limbal transplantation. There is CLAU, CCLAU, LRCLAL, KLAL. I know it's pretty confusing. So I have tried to simplify it a little bit for you guys. So what is limbal graft? There is an autograft. That is, if you have a healthy eye along with a chemical, uh, there, if there is one eye that is injured chemically and the other eye that is normal or having a healthy limbus, we take limbus from the healthy eye and transplant it into the diseased eye or the eye that has been affected. So this is an autograft. You have two methods of doing an autograft here. That is an allograft is when you take it from a cadaver or a living relate, close relative. That is how do you do allograft. Then there are two ways you can do an autograft. That is by doing slit. That is simple limbal epithelial transplantation or conjunctival limbal auto transplantation. So how do you do these two? I will come to that if I have time. Well, allograft, as I said, it can be taken from a close relative or a cadaver. Now, there are two ways you can do this. It can be a non-culture. That is, you straight away take the limbus, transplant it. Or you can take a bit of these and culture it in the lab. So this becomes cultured. So I think I have simplified it a little bit. 
So now when you get back to this table, you can see that the limbal transplantation, there is an autograft and these two are the allograft. This can be from the cadaver or the living related. Now when all this is cultured, you have another category that is with a CU added to it. That's all. We never do a keratolimbal allograft now. So now coming to examples, you have a diseased eye. So what do you do for this eye? What can you do? The question is how is the other eye? If this is the other eye, you can definitely not do a autograph because the other eye limbus is damaged or even worse. So if the other eye was a beautiful eye like this, then you can think of an autograft. But if this was this, then you have to think of an allograft. You will have to depend on his mother, father or uh, from a cadaver, you will have to take the limbus and transplant it to the patient. But the problem or the thing that we are discussing here is we may have to put the patient on a lifetime immunosuppressive drugs that may systemically hamper him. So it's a do or die situation or a catch 22 situation whether you want to proceed to an allograft. The next in line if you have a wet ocular surface one thing you can do for this eye would be a keratoprosthesis. Here but the problem is we should be doing this for the best eye. That means the other eye should have a vision less than the diseased eye or the injured eye. So that is only that is when you do a keratoprosthesis. Now what is simple limbal epithelial transplantation? We actually take the limbus from the opposite healthy eye. You cut it into segments, small small segments. Then in the diseased eye you debride the surface of the vascularizations. You place the amniotic membrane on the uh, diseased eye. Then you cut these limbus into small small segments and spread it over the surface. This is simple limbal epithelial transplantation. The PGs, please remember, this is a very important technique. It has huge amount of importance nowadays and it is coming up. So it is the procedure of limbal epithelial transplantation preferred by many surgeons. Now, one thing to note here is that in unilateral partial limbal stem cell deficiencies, we may observe do a mechanical debridement or an amniotic membrane would help. So the next is penetrating keratoplasty. If you have healthy limbus by limbal transplantation, then you can think of a keratoplasty. A blank keratoplasty with a damaged limbal surface wouldn't serve the purpose. So a limbus has to be there, healthy limbus surface has to be there before you plan a keratoplasty. You can do it in the same setting or you can wait for three months and then plan a keratoplasty later as well. Keratoprosthesis is also a topic to be discussed. Now this is what I meant by a K-Pro or a this is two forms, two types are there. There is Boston K-Pro and an Oro K-Pro. We have a base plate. Then this is the corneal graft from the donor and this is the disc. So this is what is giving the power, the power to the eye. So this you make a hole in the center of the corneal graft and then fix it with the help of the base plate onto the. Then you suture this onto the diseased eye like we do a PKP. Here the only thing is we should have a wet surface. Now let's say coming back to the examples, wh what do you do for this eye? You always ask how the other eye is. It's healthy. So you will plan a select. The next thing, this is the eye. What do you do for this procedure? Again, you have to ask how is the other eye? The other eye is even worse. So that means you can't plan a select here. You don't have a limbus. You can do a allograft, which is highly not preferred in this kind of an eye. So what do you do? You can go for a Boston K Pro. Well, now this is for a wet surface eye. Now, if it is a very dry eye like this, what do you do? You always have to ask, how is the other eye? It's also the same. It's dry and keratinized. Then the only option you have for this surface is an MOOKP. That is Modified Osteoodendokeratoprosthesis. Well, how do you do this? This is a six months procedure. We do three in three phases. We wait, do one phase wait for two months, do the second phase, then we wait for two months and do the third phase. What do we do here? As this technique rightly says, it has to do something with the bone, something to do with, with the tooth and something to do with the cornea. So first we take in a mucous membrane, uh, oral mucosa and suture it onto the ocular surface. Meantime, we make take the extracted tooth and a bone and we drill in an optical cylinder into the bony part and we bury it into the cheek and wait for it to vascularize. Then later on we take it out and suture it back under the oral mucosal graft that has been accepted 
by the eye. That's a short form of the modified osteoodontokeratoprosthesis. processes. With that, I conclude my presentation, thanking my mentors, Dr. Srinivas K. Rao and Dr. Muhammad Sadiq for being a wonderful clinician, wonderful surgeon and all the more wonderful teacher to me. Thank you. And thank you one and all for being with me throughout these 15 minutes. And once again, thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. It's really been a privilege to be here among eminent faculties. Thank you one and all.